this is Karen Andrews and welcome to uh, today's video blog. I have the privilege of having Lisa Heike joining me from Sydney and her new book, It Started With A Kiss, is over my right hand shoulder. And Lisa is uh, the author of this and four other novels and she studied journalism at Queensland University before moving to Sydney to work in uh, publishing as an acquisitions editor before then moving into magazine publishing as a feature writer and now she is a novelist and so I thought that she could share some of her wisdom with us today about how she manages to uh, apply all the skills that she's had in her career up until now uh, as well as talking about the way she researches her novels and talk about a little bit about her writing process so thank you for joining me Lisa thank you thanks <laughs> We've already, you're welcome we've already had a bit of a chuckle <laughs> behind yes. the scenes so this, this is gonna be fun <laughs> so um, your writing process now you're a mother of three and, and yes. I'm a mother of two mm -hmm. and um, uh, one of the questions I most often asked is how you manage to fit your writing into everything else you have to do. So I'm going to ask you that question. How do you do it? How do I do it? I, uh, well, I lock the children in a cupboard and then I have a few hours to myself during the day. Uh, no, look, my children are older now. So I've got, um, my youngest is 14 and a half oh. and my oldest has just turned 19. Right. Right. Uh, so my kids are very independent. However, having said that, you know, I sometimes think it was a lot easier to write when they were all... Um, Napping? You know, when I had three kids under five and, I, you know, I knew they were having naps when they were sleeping and when they were at childcare and all of that sort of thing. When the kids actually started school, I found my days were, were much shorter because I just had between sort of a quarter past nine to about 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, yet when they were very little, I seemed to have a lot, lot you know, I had, seemed to have more time to write. I don't know quite why that worked the way it did. Uh, and now, of course, that they're much older, one's at uni, one's doing year 12, I, I have that time back again because, um, you know, the oldest two drive and you know, aren't, aren't as demanding. They still need food. They're still screaming for food all the time. Uh, but uh, but in the main, it's I have a lot more time again now. I've regained my space. So when they were very little, uh, yes. what were you writing at the time? Was that when you were doing features uh, or was that back even? With yes, yes. So I uh, worked for ACP magazines so on... Um, practical parenting and bride-to-be. So, you know, in the mornings I'd be talking about mastitis and toddler training and then in the afternoons I'd be talking about, you know, sexy lingerie and, you know, for the for the bride-to-be. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the children were in, especially the three and the five-year-old were in um, were in daycare and I would have three days a week where I, where I worked um, and they were long days. They were like, eight in the morning till about five in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, then, and then when I had my third child in 2000, I thought, okay, the time had come. It was now or never. I, I just wanted to, to write fiction. So, so I just thought, okay, you, you just have to do it. Stop talking about it and get on with it. That's fantastic. And I must say I was very disciplined in those early years uh, when the children were very young because I had to be. Because I, you know, once they were asleep or at daycare or at school, I just knuckled down and, and wrote. So that sounds that I could be wrong. That being disciplined for me means that I try when I'm have really big blocks of time yeah. to that I want to get a, a lot of writing laid down. Yes. Uh, I try and hit daily targets. Is that the kind of words? Yes. Is that a absolutely, do? absolutely. So, for example, well. Nowadays, I, I wish I could stick to what I'm telling you now, but um, I would like to write 2,000 words a day, four days a week. So that's about, you know, give or take seven to 9,000 words a week, yeah, which I think is doable when the writing's flowing. So when your scenes are working and you've got the ideas and, and you're obviously motivated to, you know, to sit down and just focus on the, um, on the story, 
uh, and that's always been pretty much my my target. Yeah, and that um, you say on on a good stretch. Does that include? So, are you a planner as well? Do you? No, have, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a pantser, which is fabulous because it means you can be spontaneous and, you know, if an idea comes to you or you read something in the paper, you can incorporate it into your story. But the downside of that, Karen, is absolutely that uh, sometimes when the writing's not flowing and you're 20,000 words into a story, you go, oh, well, what happens next? What do I do? How do I, how do I get through this, um, you know, crisis, this sagging middle sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, there's, I think I've had, I've certainly had one book and I think there was a second book as well There was actually where I, the 20,000 mark is pretty yeah. much a benchmark of make or break. You either, you get to that point and you go, okay, I can, <laughs> I can see, I can see it yeah. sort of unfolding yeah. or it's just like, I, I think it's done. I think it's kind of <laughs> came to its own natural conclusion. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I just talk so, about, you know, I, I throw in a, this is, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm just talking off the top of my head, but when I do get to that a roadblock, I go, okay, well, let's throw in a holiday or a flashback of a holiday. I mean, you're always progressing the story further, but I find a change of scene. So, for example, you know, when Lucy Springer gets even, they went to Bali. In, um, you know, other books, Claudia, she went to Santorini. And I just find that even, you know, little little things like that, Obviously, it's got to be plausible, yeah. but can start you on a whole new tangent. Exactly. And, and, and started know. with the kiss as yes. multiple points of view. Well, there's two main points of view as well. So that's yeah. another way you can approach that. Abs yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In It started with a kiss. We've got the protagonist's um, first person point of view. Friday is her name. Her, her first person point of view. And then her husband or her ex-husband, we get his story but it's told from third person. So it's still his thoughts and his his story, but um, it's just a, a different um, point of view. Yeah, no, that's great. And so with um, when you came to writing novels, how did you feel that your work in publishing, for starters, helped you? Did it, you think it set you up to be a better writer because you, you know both sides, of, uh, both sides of the look, industry? I think, I think it helped me again sort of the discipline wise and because back when I worked in publishing I would obviously work with authors and even though the majority of um, books I was commissioning were non-fiction uh, so it's a you know it's a different writing style yeah. obviously when you're doing creative writing but I absolutely understood the commitment that these authors needed to make you know it didn't matter that um, you know the kids were on school holidays or, you know, someone had broken their leg or, you know, or they were doing sole parenting. If they had a commitment to write uh, the book and a deadline, they virtually had to stick to it because in publishing, you know, you have to stick to a deadline because it go, has to go to print and then there's distribution and publication dates and all of that sort of thing. So if you're late with your submission, mm. it pulls everything back and everything, you know, goes into free fall because they can't be published on that particular um, day or month or academic year. Yeah. So I certainly learnt the discipline side of it and the, you know, the fact that it was a lot of hard work and research and um, again just that sitting down bums on seat sort of thing sitting down and and just writing even when the news isn't firing I guess you've just got to so I, so I certainly learnt that uh, when I was um, a feature writer at the magazines uh, again it was all about deadlines getting the story down and it didn't matter so what if you've got a headache or you're up all night with the baby you still have to submit that story at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, it's like ooh, that's, um, that's my microphone. Then uh, I think yeah, and, and a lot of people sort of when they're looking into it, they it it, it can be quite easily romanticised and glamorised. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it, it is it's work. It's you know, and I find a lot of the time it's fun work. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. Um, because writing, you know, well, I always think about it like this when I'm feeling a bit, you know, when I, when I feel down or I'm going, oh, God, I don't think I've got, a, you know, I can't figure out another story. Then I'll just say to myself, hang on, 
you're at the start, you've got 90,000 words to play with, you can create this amazing imaginary world and play with all the, you know, your imaginary friends. Um, it should be fun because in your, in your books and in fiction, you can make the characters say and do things that in real life you'd, you'd never have the, um, have the confidence to do. You know, they come up with the best lines in arguments and fights and that sort of thing that you only think of, or me, Personally, I only think of it at 3 o'clock the next morning when I wake up and go, ah, oh, I should have said that. Yes, right. Whereas when you're writing and creating this whole new world and a whole new, you know, families and friendships and romances, you, um, you know, you, you have the ability, you have, you're in control. You're in control of their destiny. Yes, right. It's, mm. it's very liberating, especially yeah, yeah. You know, as, you yeah. know, the old thing of, you know, you write bad things to people who you <laughs> may or may not be based on real people and you can resolve conflicts, you know, yeah. Yeah. that you might be able to do, <laughs> etc. So you, you said the word uh, research and um, yes. that's a huge part of um, novels really, like more in like historical novels obviously or things like that. Mm. But, um, I mean, in It's Side of the Kiss, uh, you mentioned in the acknowledgements at the back about people who help you along the way and, like, you talked about, I think, you needed to research the stand-up scene because Liam, the husband, the ex-husband, uh, was getting into that yes. sort of uh, avenue. Yep. And naturopathy is what uh, is Friday's occupation. So h how do you offer, how do you pick what occupations match well, them up with your characters? Uh, the story with this one was that, and again, because I'm a pantser, I just start with an idea and just go. So when I was writing the first draft, Friday was an interior designer. Oh, okay. And I got to about 30,000 words and I, I don't know anything about interior design either but I just, it was just in the back of my mind that that's what she was. So every time I would, she'd be at work or something, I'd just, you know, put an X or something and know that I was going to come and fill that out in the second draft. What happened was I just thought, given Friday's crises and what was going on in her personal life, it was a better fit for her to be um, a, a naturopath because naturopaths promote healthy lifestyles and healthy living and good eating and that sort of thing. And Friday at the beginning of the novel is on a downward spiral. So I thought, ah, that's a good conflict in itself because here she is having clients and saying to clients, yes, you know, look after yourself and have these vitamins and, and do this and, you know, take care of yourself. And meanwhile, you know, she, personally she's plummeting. So, so that's so I changed tack halfway through my first draft and then for the second draft uh, it was very much more about fleshing out um, the work roles of all the various people involved. So, so Friday, yes, fleshing out her job as a naturopath and obviously I had to research that on the internet and talking to naturopaths and, and things like that. With Liam, you talk about him, well, you mentioned that he uh, does a stand-up workshop and I threw that in again in the second or third draft because I felt that he didn't have a strong enough storyline. Mm. There needed to be something more to him than just going to work and living with his brother and going to the pub and, you know, watching football. Um, you know, he needed to be a more rounded character and I thought that was a good thing for him because he'd always harboured a secret desire to do stand-up. So, so, yeah, so obviously I had to research that as well. When you're teaching, because you do teach this subject, uh, well, writing um, fiction for the Australian Writers' Centre, is this what you tell your students to do to help sort of flesh out characters, is to sort of introduce new facets, um, yeah, even, yeah. even as the story progresses? Because sometimes um, you, when I'm writing, a character can start off in my head as one way and end up completely different oh, towards the end, and, so, and for the better for it too. So it's, it's very absolutely. nebulous. And also, you know, uh, when I get feedback from editors, they will say to me things like, you know, we need this character to be more rounded. Mm -hmm. So you're focused on the social life or the parenting life or the family life of this person, but what about their, you know, work colleagues? Or alternatively, it might be that I'm so focused on one particular aspect of someone's story that an editor will come back to me and go, uh, you do realise that Friday doesn't have very many friends or whoever it is that I'm writing about. I go, oh, yeah, because, you know, and then they'll go, because, you know, in your normal day-to-day -day life, if you're, um, you know, if you've got children, 
10 to 1 you'll, you'll see, you know, parents at the school pickup or at the supermarket or, you know, incidental, you know, your, your meetings just because, um, because you, you do know people. So it's important to put that sort of thing in as well. Not the banal everyday stuff like I'm staring out the window drinking my 20th cup of coffee for the day, but more to just make sure that that, that character is, yeah. is three-dimensional and real. Exactly. exactly. Mm. Um, so I think. Oh, my microphone again. Uh, is there any other? Is there, is there one before we leave? Is there one last tip or anything else you'd like to say about someone who is interested in and perhaps writing a novel in this in this genre that you think? You oh, help? I, w I would definitely say. Um, look, ha have a look at the books you read. To be a writer, you need to be a reader. So, for example, I've met people before who say, oh, I really want to write um, a Harlequin, Mills and Boone. And I go, okay, well, what's your favourite um, Mills and Boone uh, novel? And they'll go, oh, I don't read it, I just want to write it. And I'll go, no, no, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or uh, I think I, I really want to write um, women's contemporary fiction or chiclet. And I'll say, okay, well, who's your favourite chiclet author? And they'll go, oh, I don't read it, I read Stephen King. I really like thrillers and crime. So I would suggest that if if uh, if you're wanting to write you should be gravitating towards the genres that you that you read so and then really looking at those authors and reading those author blogs and and Karen practicing Absolutely. just practicing you know like um, again I meet people who go oh, I'm too afraid to write dialogue well that's unfortunate because you're going to have to mm -hmm. uh, it's so you know it's all about practice and letting yourself go and not being restrained by anything. So if your if your book or your story lends itself to um, two characters having sex, then you know, don't be afraid to write that sex scene even though you're going, oh my god, I don't want dad to read this or I don't want my son to read this or I don't want my husband to read this or whatever it is. I think you really have to let yourself go and writing is all about trusting yourself and developing your own voice and the only way you can develop your voice is by, by practicing and that means dialogue, point of view, um, yeah, sex scenes if they're relevant, narrative, all of that sort of thing and it means absolutely reading widely so absolutely. that you know what you like and you don't like. I think one last uh, point before I leave it is there is that the more you know about the, the, the field that you want to be published in, the mm. more that the editors and the publishers will be impressed with you because you know, you're aware of the market, you know what you might sort of what hole that you might be filling or yep. what yes. uh, the point of difference is and that, yeah, could, and that could be just that little bit of difference that makes steps you above you know all the oh, other people. Absolutely. And I would also say adding to that is that when you think your manuscript is ready to be sent to a publisher and I guess I'm talking about traditional print publishers like Penguin, Allen and Unwin, Random House, that sort of thing. Yeah. Really, it's not good enough to send the manuscript in saying, oh, my mum read this and she loves it. I think that if you're really serious about getting published, you need to get a really good freelance editor who it knows your genre, whether that's crime, thriller, romance, who can look at it objectively and go, hey, I think you need to do a little bit more work on X, Y and Z before you submit it to a publisher. Yeah. Because generally speaking, publishers are looking for chances to reject. They get so many submissions. Um, that they're really they're looking for you know opportunities to go yep yeah, no this isn't up to scratch so you know and then you've lost your opportunity yeah perfect I think that's some excellent tips there from you and yeah. um, before we go I do like to ask what everybody is reading at the moment can you show me what you I, are because you already showed I, me before I can I can I'm reading can you see that um, yep. the most of Nora Ephraim and. Yes. It was given to me uh, as a Christmas present, and I, you know, I know it's January, but um, I, I'm I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. She's, you know, she's a writer. She's a, a screenwriter. She's a, you know, a novelist. She's just everything. And, oh, she's amazing! Yeah. Amazing she's, talent. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so it's great knowing all, you know, learning all about her early life. As, um, as a journalist and a writer at, at magazines and newspapers to when she was writing, um, you know, movies like When Harry Met Sally and yeah. 
sleepless in Seattle and that. Yeah, Excellent. right. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's quite good, big too, because some of our other collections are quite narrow. But as you say, the and, most and the great them. thing about it is that it's compartmentalized. So um, you, you know, you can read, you can read a couple of her posts and then put it down and come back. It's not an ongoing story. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, thank you for that. And mine actually is just here. I'm reading Carl Sagan's Contact. Oh, okay. Because uh, I've always wanted to read it, and it's pretty fabulous yeah. so far. So I just thought I'd just throw that in there. And <laughs> for everybody. So I think I, our time is up. So I really would like to thank you, Lisa, for joining me today. Thank you. Thank and you. It's been wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. Me too. And all, all the best for the continued success for It Started With The Kiss and all the other books that I'm sure are to come. So. <laughs> oh, thank you. I hope. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll happen. So thank you again, Lisa. Okay, thanks Karen.